Hello and welcome to Cole Red Plays Raid Shadow Legends. I am Cole Red. Thank you for joining me today. And in today's video, we are taking on the Ice Golems Peak. So this is going to be a dungeon guide for the Ice Golems Peak. We're going to go over everything you need to know in terms of putting together a team uh, in the earlier game, mid game, and on into late game. So we'll take it right up to stage 25. Um, and yeah, one of the things about Ice Golems Peak to know is that this is probably the least popular dungeon to actually farm. Typically, you you get in here only because you have like a tournament going on or you need clan v clan points or something like that, or you have to do, a, um, you know, a quest of some sort, maybe an arbiter mission. So this isn't some place you're going to farm a ton of. And as a result, you don't necessarily need the most optimized team. You just want a team that's as close to 100 percent success rate on auto as you can get. So you can go ahead, click those auto battles and let it run. Now, if we jump into the actual dungeon, you can see the the reason why it's not so popular is because the artifact drops are typically not great. There are three sets in here, or actually four sets, I would say. There are four sets that you do want to think about. You're not going to need a ton of these sets, but they do provide some value. The first is resistance. So resistance is just, you know, you're not going to need a lot of sets of resistance, but it just gives you 40%, uh, not 40%, 40 flat resistance. Um, which is nice if you're building somebody that you need to uh, resist, maybe uh, like your team cleanser. You want to make sure they have a high resistance so that they don't get stunned or slowed or CC'd in some other way and that they can cleanse the rest of the team who does, right? Um, the second set here is Retaliation. Retaliation has recently been changed. It was a four-piece set, four set, and now it's a two-piece set, and they've reduced the overall chance to counterattack. But I think that added flexibility of going down to a two piece set actually makes retaliation more viable than it used to be, because now you can combine it with some of those powerful four piece sets and still get that extra 15 percent chance to counterattack. So if you have anybody for whom, you know, counterattack is a good build, consider retaliation sets. And because you only need two pieces, that allows you to be more flexible with where those pieces are, right? You know, which pieces you actually use. So I do think this is a pretty good set to farm here. Reflex is probably the most powerful set uh, in the dungeon, and this has a 40% chance to reduce a random skill cooldown by one turn. There are definitely some champions you will want to consider reflex sets on, and this would be the primary reason to come farm here. But you don't need that many reflex sets. You know, if you're a free-to-play player, maybe you end up with like two champions in reflex, maybe three. Um, you could certainly fall in love with the set and then use it a lot. I do think it's an underutilized set, but often we're building team compositions for which maybe Reflex is not the optimal set. Um, but it definitely can be a powerful set, especially in very specific cases. And finally, the, the last set here is the Provoke set. I would say this is, you know, along, this was probably on par with like Retaliation and Resistance in the sense that you're going to want some of it. Uh, you're not going to want a ton of it, um, but a good Provoke set on a champion that has AoEs can be a great way to add CC into a composition that maybe doesn't have it. You know, we typically go with a stun set, but a stun set only has an 18% chance of landing its debuff, whereas the provoke set has a 30% chance to place the provoke. Now, obviously, if you provoke an enemy, you will still get hit by that enemy. That's why, um, you know, they give you a higher percent chance of provoke because it's not as powerful a CC. But if you can put this on somebody who's fairly survivable or you can build survivability into your team composition, a provoke set can give you a nice additional way to uh, control the enemies in wave content. Okay, so the first stage we're actually gonna look at is stage 16. And we're just gonna go here at the boss guide and read through the fight so we know what the fight is all about. Okay, so before we even get into the skills, the first thing to note here is that just like in the Dragon's Lair and in the Fire Knight's Castle, you have two waves of enemies you have to defeat before getting to the boss. However, unlike those boss fights, in this boss fight, the boss has minions. So the Ice Golem has two minions, and we also have to worry about those. Okay, so as we look at the boss's skills, we notice just like in the Dragon Dungeon, there are two AoEs. Uh, the first one's Frost Nova, which is just a basic attack. The second one is uh, Numbing Chill, which places a decreased accuracy debuff for two turns. Now that decreased accuracy might not seem life-threatening, but it is in fact important because it can reduce your ability to land turn meter control. Uh, this boss can be turn meter controlled. It will also reduce your chance of landing maybe important debuffs, whether those are crowd control debuffs or um, you know damage debuffs or, or a decreased attack, for instance, on the boss, which can be very helpful here 
to prevent him from nuking out your team. So this decreased accuracy is not inconsiderable, and you may want to consider uh, adding a cleanser to your team. Now, there's a second reason to also add a cleanser to your team. It's because of this Frigid Vengeance, which is an unlocked skill. It is an AoE. It attacks all enemies one time whenever Clasis's HP drops below 80%, 60%, 45 30 and 15%. So five times in the fight, there are health uh, pool thresholds, I guess, that when you bring the boss below that threshold, he will do this AOE. Now, it doesn't matter where his turn meter is. As soon as he drops below the, one of these thresholds, he'll just hit your team. When he hits your team, this attack will also revive any dead allies, so he'll bring his minions back. This attack will ignore 50% of each enemy's defense for each alive ally. So having his minions dead when Frigid Vengeance, Vengeance happens is really important because if he has one minion alive, he's going to ignore 50% of your defense. If he has two minions alive, he's ignoring 100% of your team's defense, and this can one-shot the team really easily, even tanky teams. Because when you think about tanky teams, in a lot of cases, you're building a lot of defense into those champions to make them tanky, and this boss is ignoring that defense. So... HP champions do a little bit better than defense champions here, but the better consideration is to just say, I want to make sure that the minions are dead when I take this boss past these health point thresholds. Okay, this attack also has a 20% chance of placing a freeze debuff for one turn. The chance of placing a freeze debuff increases by 40% for each alive ally. So again, if both allies, both minions are alive, he has a 100% chance of placing a freeze on you. I believe that this can be resisted, um, so it's potentially possible to have high enough to resist to um, you know, not have this happen. I don't think it's irresistible, but I'm not 100% sure on that, um, so we can definitely check into that. But we typically don't build all of our champions with a ton of resist, so you know, even if you can resist it, likelihood is most of your champions won't. So the better way to deal with this is to make sure that those minions are dead, and then again, you will get some value out of a cleanser here. Maybe just have your cleanser in high resist, which is a good idea anyway. Um, and so then, you know, that cleanser would potentially be able to resist the freeze and then unfreeze the rest of your team. Almighty immunity is the same as in other dungeons where you can't CC the boss and you can't use HP exchange effects and so on and so forth. You can, you can turn meter control this boss. Um, it's less valuable here in this fight. Not that it's not valuable. It is valuable, but it's less valuable here in this fight because remember, no matter what you do, uh, the boss has these thresholds. So you can't avoid getting hit sometimes. You're going to get hit by this boss. So there's no way to like, say in the Fire Knight, you can prevent the Fire Knight from taking a turn at all. Even if you prevent the Ice Golem here from taking a regular turn, he still has this ability to potentially attack you uh, as his threshold drops. Now, there is something that goes on here, which is that he will only attack once when a threshold drops. So if you pass more than one threshold in a single go, so let's say you are able to take 50% of his HP in one big hit. So you go from like 95% all the way down to, let's say 94% all the way down to 44%. You would be passing three of his thresholds. He'll only attack you once. So you can go for a really hard nuke strategy, but remember, if his allies are alive, he's got a chance to one-shot your team. So typically, you would want to make sure that you clear the minions first, and then you can take as many thresholds off as you can, and then hopefully survive that one big hit. And then he'd be very close to dead, and you could potentially take him down past the other two thresholds, and then you would, wouldn't get hit because if he's dead, he can't hit you at the 30% and 50%, a uh, 15%. So you can potentially just build a team that's going to nuke really hard and only get hit probably once, maybe twice. Um, and you just want to account for that in your team composition. One last consideration here is one strategy that we're going to talk about is that you can bring block revives so that the minions can't be brought back. So this attack will revive any dead allies. You can prevent that with a block revive champion. There are several in the game. The most popular easy one here at the beginning of the game is going to be Armager. Um, and we can talk about him in a second. It is a little bit tricky to use block revive with auto battles. So if you're just letting it run, you don't know if the skill is going to be off cooldown at the right moment or if the champion is going to be targeting the minion at the right moment. Um, so there's actually a champion, Lua, I believe her name is, who is an epic, who has an AoE that 
If it kills an enemy, block survives. So that can be a little bit better for an auto battle team. Um, but this is something to consider, especially if you're trying to, say, clear stage 20 or stage 25 for like one of the Arbiter or Montu missions. OK, so I'm going to build a stage 16 team here. I don't have any preset saved teams for Ice Golem because I typically just don't run it very often. So whatever was my last successful team stays here and I just use that. So I'm actually going to build these from scratch right now. And basically what I want to consider is I don't want too much speed, right? I don't want to go too many times because if I go too many times, um, I could potentially like nuke out the Ice Golem boss and then get hit back without, you know, if his minions are alive, I can get hit back and he can ignore all my defense and I can get wiped out. But at the same time, I don't want to go so slow that the waves kill me. Um, so I want somewhere in between. I want a little bit of turn meter. I want a little bit of speed, but not too much. So we have to decide where to start here. And for right now, I'm just going to I'm not going to use a speed lead. Instead, I'm going to use um, Apothecary. Now, Apothecary is going to speed up my team. He's also going to give me a nice ally defense in dungeons buff uh, by 21 percent. So again, I'm going to probably go tanky here, especially early in the game. Again, you can use our three methods for controlling waves. One is nuke out the waves. Two is crowd control the waves. And three is tank the waves. And so we're probably going to go with method three here, which isn't going to be fast, but it gives us a better chance of surviving the boss as well, because a tanky team uh, with a lot of heals and maybe shields or, or strengthens or those kinds of buffs that help you survive, um, that's going to be better for the boss. Now, as our damage dealer, we're going to bring in our level 50 Kale. Um, I want to, you know, not, I want to go as free to play friendly as possible. I want to use a starter champion here. My other starter champions are a little bit too strong. So I'm going to start here with Kale um, and hopefully he won't nuke so hard that he just activates that boss uh, massive hit, you know, the, the health threshold hit. Um, I'm going to stay away from Coldheart. Coldheart will absolutely, you know, get me in trouble because if she hits too hard at the wrong time and the minions are up, we're going to get wiped out. So I'm going to avoid her for right now. OK, so I have rounded out my team. I bought in Rector Draft for a little bit more damage mitigation plus a revive if I need it. Um, I also want at least two sources of healing, if not three sources of healing. So here I have Apothecary and Rector Draft. Between them, hopefully, as long as Rector Draft doesn't get nuked out, we should be fine in terms of support. Um, I want to bring a decrease attack. So I've brought in Paidma here. Now, my Paidma is one of my earliest epics. Um, I haven't rebuilt her in a very, very long time. She's built decently well. She, she If you don't know her, um, she is a defensive base champion. She also gets a little value out of attack. Um, and she has a 100% uh, a AOE decrease attack debuff from her A1 if it crits. And she does have 100% crit rate, I believe. So this should always make sure that the boss has decrease attack, which will prevent us hopefully from getting nuked out. And then I'm bringing in Armager here because that is probably the most accessible early game champ um, that's going to allow you to have a block revive. Another option here would be Phoenix, who's an epic. Uh, he's a very good epic. In fact, he would be better probably than uh, Armager in terms of activating that block revive because Phoenix's block revive hits extremely hard, whereas Armager's is a little bit of a you know less damaging hit. Um, but he's easier to build. Obviously, everybody's going to have access to him, so anybody can build him. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that you go right away and six star an Armager in the early game. Uh, that's your call. I've actually just six starred my Armager not that long ago after two years. I wanted to have him for some content, so I built him out recently. Um, but I've never really used him prior to this point. And you can get by without an Armager. Um, I know he's the best uncommon in the game, and I know he has value at endgame. So he's definitely worth a six star. But on my account, I happen to just get champions that made it not as reasonable to level him up early on. Um, but I think that this team composition is relatively free to play friendly. Um, you know, we only have one void epic here. And again, you don't necessarily need Paidma. You just probably want somebody with a drop defense for, I'm sorry, a drop attack, a decrease attack for the boss. Um, but she's also going to help me with a little bit of wave clear because she has a decent AOE nuke. All right, so let's just go ahead and run this and see how this team does. Now, the first thing I'll say here is that you want to remember this will not be a fast run. This dungeon tends to be slower than the other dungeons. Um, simply because you you have to account for one very difficult waves and two that potential for the boss to ignore 100 percent of defense if you don't have the right team composition and if you don't handle the fight in the right way. 
One thing you can definitely do in the Ice Golem's Peak is you can manual these fights, especially the boss fight. A lot of times I won't manual the waves, but if you watch your fight and you get into a tricky spot with the Ice Golem himself, go ahead and manual the fight and make sure you're controlling those damage thresholds so that you don't accidentally cross one of those at the wrong time. And this can be especially valuable if you're just trying to progress in the dungeon, maybe get to a higher level um, for, you know, like an Arbiter mission, like we said before. All right, we're not having much trouble with the waves. Uh, Padma is definitely bringing in some nuke damage along with Kale. So that's helping us get through these waves relatively quickly. You can see Armager actually used his block revive there. There's no revive on the waves, but he did use it. So he does have that, but he's probably not going to block revive on any of these minions unless we get very lucky. And if he does, that's just great because then we don't have to worry about 100% um, defense, you know, 100% ignored defense from the boss. That would now max it out at 50% if one of the minions is alive. So if Armager happens to kill this minion at the right moment, so that's okay though, because as we pass this 80% and the boss is going to hit us, um, no minions are alive and we should be fine. Here it is. That's a big hit. We have the perfect veil from Rector Drath, which mitigates a bunch of the defense. I'm sorry, a bunch of the damage. And then again, we have that decrease attack from Padma, which is helping mitigate more damage. And as long as we have the minions dead, this is going to be a nice, easy run. It's probably going to take four minutes. That's fine, you know. But um, we don't have to worry about potentially getting nuked out. We have the two healers, uh, a little bit of a speed buff. So, you know, no, no real big turn meter control. We have Armager who's doing some turn meter control. Um, but this is just about staying alive. Oh, we do have a, um, we do have a re heal reduction on Kale right now. So he might die, but we do have Rector Drath to bring him back if he does. Hopefully we can get a heal on him. He does have lifesteal, but he doesn't have really any mastery, so he's not going to get a big heal at any point. There's the big nuke. The ads come back, and we just rinse and repeat. If we have to do this five times, we do it five times. Um, but again, as long as you focus down the ads, for the most part, you're not going to be in serious damage, and that decrease attack just uh, you know, further helps us in that regard. So I did see a resist there from Rector Drath. So she resisted the freeze. So you definitely can build resist or immunity into uh, a champion, especially if you have a cleanser, and that will help you here. Okay, so 356, not awful. Uh, we did get a piece of retaliation gear here. Any good? Yeah, not awful. Um, this would be something to consider keeping, especially because it has you know both speed and crit damage. I would prefer crit right here. Um, or, you know, sometimes you want retaliation on a defensive champion. So you'd be looking for like HP or maybe uh, accuracy or resistance. Remember, you can't get defense on a weapon, but I don't need this piece. So I'm just going to go ahead and sell it. So that is stage 16. Um, you know, none of these champions are built very well, but they're all built pretty well. So, you know, in terms of the stats, obviously, you're going to have to kind of feel that out as you go. Remember that having lifesteal gear in this one dungeon can be really, really helpful, especially early on with your nukers, making sure that they're always topped off. And if you are at six star, if you have either Giant Slayer or War Master, those procs will heal you up a lot if you have lifesteal. Another option is to make sure you have a leech on the boss, and that will do the same thing with those War Master and Giant Slayer procs. Okay, let's step it up to stage 20. Uh, I'm not sure if this team could do stage 20. I'm a little worried about my level 50s. So I'm going to swap those out and bring in some different champions that would be good here at stage 20. Now, one of the things you want to always look out when you're farming stage 20 and building a stage 20 uh, auto battle team is the affinity of the boss. We have a spirit affinity boss here. So we want to stay away from force affinity champions if we can. Um, we don't want weak hits on our debuffs and so forth. We also don't want to take those extra crit damages. Um, so you have a 15% extra chance of being crit against. I think it's 15%. Um, so you want to remove that. So we're just going to pull out these 250s here. And I'm going to go ahead and think about, I don't know who I'm going to put in, actually. Uh, probably Scylla the Drake. Scylla the Drake is a great champion for this. And of course, she uh, is a good replacement for Rector Drath because now she is 
strong affinity as opposed to weak affinity. She still brings heals and a single target revive. Plus, we also get a slow out of her, which would be useful and a little bit more turn meter control. We do lose the damage mitigation of Rector Drath's Perfect Veil, but that's okay. We're going to stay here with um, Sill of the Drakes. And now we've lost one of our damage dealers, so I might want to bring in a little bit more damage. And I'm trying to think of who would be good for that. I could just bring in another starter champion. Let's do that. Let's go ahead and bring in El Hain. Now, El Hain um, has a stun set on her, so that's going to help me in the waves a little bit. Um, and it could also help me with the boss's minions. You can also, you know, crowd control the boss's minions. So this is basically the same team with a little bit more damage, no poisons, right? A little bit more direct damage, a little bit more crowd control. Um, and, you know, hopefully this will be enough. That slow could also help us out. And again, we've avoided any weak affinity champions. So let's go ahead and try this team out and see how it works on stage 20. I think we'll have a little bit better luck here with the waves because of the extra crowd control. We have two different stuns, one with the stun set from El Hain, and then uh, Scylla the Drakes has her AoE stun. And then otherwise, the fight should look very similar to what we just had. Again, you know, you could pull in a different champion than Paid Me here for the decrease attack, but having that decrease attack will, will help you with the waves, um, and it will also help you with the boss on those nukes. I'm going to take myself off the screen here, let you watch this fight, and hopefully it won't take too long. We'll see how long it goes. Okay, so there we have it. Not a fast run, again, five and a half minutes. But two things you may notice here is I didn't bring in either a decreased defense or a weakened champion because I wanted to reduce the chance of my team getting nuked out when I was auto battling. However, if you have stronger champions or stronger gear or you know this fight a little bit better, you can certainly bring in those debuffs and that will speed up the run considerably. You can see my best is under two minutes here in 51 turns. So I don't even know what team did that, but clearly there we were damaging the boss a lot faster. Um, let's take a look at our chess piece here. Defense percentage in an offense set. Not totally awful, awful with the attack percentage um, substat, but without crit rate or speed or something else. Not a piece I'm going to hold on to. I usually don't hold on to offense sets anymore anyway. Okay, so I had a little bit of technical difficulty, but I am finally back here at stage 25 of the ice golems peak and one of the things that happens is when you get to stages 21 through 25 the fights change the boss fights change so you want to go to the boss guide and just check out what the changes are and as you can see we have two additional passives here for the boss the first one almighty strength says damage from skills that scale based on enemy max hp cannot exceed 10 percent of the boss's max hp when attacking the boss so basically this is true for all of the dungeon bosses but when they get almighty strength Max HP damage dealers do less damage. So Cold Heart, uh, Royal Guard, you know, champions that do damage based on max HP of their target um, are going to be less valuable. Doesn't you can't bring them. You can still bring them. Um, but it does mean that, you know, you're going to get less value for that. So you may want to consider whether you want to bring those types of champions or not. For the Ice Golem, I actually feel like Almighty Strength helps us out a little bit because what it means is your max HP hits probably won't push the boss over the, the HP thresholds too easily. You know, we still have those thresholds at 80%, 60%, 45%, 30 and 15 So a 10% hit could go over a threshold, right? But it, it's less likely when, than like a 20% or 30% max HP hit. So it's almost a little bit friendly in this particular boss fight, but it's still something to consider when you're building your team composition. The second passive is Almighty Persistence which is the same as, again, as the other fights, where turn meter reduction effects are decreased by 50% when used against the boss. Now, the first thing to remember is this is not any kind of reduction against the waves or against the boss's minions. So in the Ice Golem, you can still get some value out of turn meter reduction on all of those other targets. And sometimes it's still just worth bringing turn meter reduction into the boss, even if it's less effective, because you want that boss to have fewer turns, and that's fine. So you might even want to double down on turn meter control if that's the route that you're going. 
OK, so with just those two differences in mind, now I'm going to go ahead and build a team. I actually don't have a pre-built stage 25 team. Whatever I cleared it with last time is what I'm using this time. And I do like to experiment around with this team. So I'm just going to go ahead and build one out right now for you. I'm actually going to do something fun for myself as well. I'm going to throw five legendaries in here, but they're all going to be free legendaries, basically. So I'm going to go with Artac. Uh, I'm going to go with Nishak. I'm going to go with, um, let's see, I'm going to bring, so I'm trying to stay, remember I've changed the affinity of the boss at stage 25, so I'm trying to stay with force affinity champs uh, as much as possible. Let's see, who else are we going to bring? Oh, I know who we're going to bring. Yeah. <laughs> All right, he's weak affinity. Uh, Newt is weak affinity, but he was the last fusion. And, and in fact, let's just do that. Let's just do fusions. Uh, so we've got four fusion champs here. We've got uh, Nishak, uh, Pythion, Newt, and Emic, who are all fusion champions. And then we have Artak, who was the free login reward champion uh, that was just before Sun Wukong. So uh, we do want to have a good aura here. So we're going to do this. Now, granted, I know that this isn't like a super free to play friendly team. You know, if you didn't, if you weren't playing when Pythion was the, the fragment, uh, I don't know if he was a fragment or a fusion event. But if you weren't playing back when Pythion was a fusion champion, um, you know, you may not have him. Obviously, he is an AOE reviver, cleanser and block damage, um, not block damage. I'm sorry. He has a block debuffs buff. So he's very strong here. And he's going to allow us to basically not have to worry about dying. If we die, you know, he's going to bring everybody back. Um, at, the only one I'm really worried about is Newt. Newt might get killed. But hopefully Emic is going to be strong enough to keep us all alive. As you can see, I'm still building these champions up, at least Emic and Newt. So they, they aren't quite finished yet. Our attack has just about been finished. I think I might need some masteries on him. So none of these guys have tier six masteries. So it wouldn't be as fast as if we did have those masteries. But this feels like a fun team to me, and I don't get to play these champions too often. I just feel like running this. So again, you could build this almost any way that you want. But remember those three different styles, whether you go with um, nuking out the waves and nuking out the boss, or you go with turn meter control or CC on the waves and turn meter control and CC on the, the boss's minions and on the boss, or you tank it up and you go that route. This route is a little bit more, that's some nukage and some tankiness, but no turn meter control at all. I don't think, I, I don't have a single skill here that's going to be any kind of turn meter control. And the only CC that I think we'll have is that our tech, I think, is in a stun set. So if we get some stuns out there, that's why that happens. Let's run it, see what happens. So we should blow through the waves a lot faster than with the other team compositions, um, but this is stage 25, so those waves are also tougher than in the previous uh, difficulty levels, in the previous stages. So. Again, I'm gonna step away, let this run. We'll see how long it takes. I'm hoping that it's gonna be the fastest run, but you never know. So as you can see, that was fairly fast. I mean, not super fast at three minutes and seven seconds, but that's only about 15 seconds slower than my best, about 20 turns slower than my, uh, or more turns than my fewest turns. So again, this is not a dungeon that I get into to farm a lot. And I just kind of mess around with teams here because it's a fun, fun fight. I actually wish that this dungeon dropped better gear because I think this is the most enjoyable and interesting fight of the four dungeons. Uh, that drop gear. So yeah, I really like this fight, but unfortunately it's just, you know, it is the way it is. The gear isn't great here. Um, let's go ahead and sell that piece. Don't need another five star there. Um, so yeah, I forgot a little bit about Newt. Uh, he obviously does have some turn meter control. So, you know, there was turn meter control in this composition. Emic did a very good job of keeping us alive along with Pythion. There was a moment where I think most of the champions died. Pythion brought the team back. But you'll notice how well the poisons and the HP burns did against uh, the Ice Golem. So 
In fact, we were having trouble. We were maxing out on our debuffs and we couldn't put more debuffs out there. But we did have that decrease attack up for most of the fight, which I think was very valuable. Um, and that is one of the things you want to consider here, because of all of the debuffs that you bring, usually you don't think that decrease attack is the most important. But I think for this boss fight, it typically is, especially if you don't have a super, super tanky team um, or, you know, a great deal of revivers and healers and stuff like that. So if you're only, you know, coming in here with one or two healers, um, definitely consider bringing a decrease attack. OK, that is it for the Ice Golem's Peak. Now, I just want to remind you all that my editor son and I will be dropping our new video series, Noob versus Pro, the Sun Wukong free to play challenge on August 22nd. So if you are interested in that new series, you want to hit the subscribe button so you'll get updated when those uh, videos go live. Also, I want to remind you and invite you to come to our Discord, uh, join our Discord community because we are creating new clans for that event. So if you're interested in looking for a new clan, if you want to roll up a new account, or if you're a new player who still hasn't found a home, come to our Discord, fill out an application uh, for one of the clans, and hopefully we'll have enough space for everybody or we'll just keep creating more clans. We can do that too. So um, yeah, so definitely do that. And thanks so much for hanging out. I've been Colred, and I hope to see you in another video very soon.